Hello everyone and welcome to the pilot episode, I guess, of a new series we're doing here on the Patreon that we are calling Vinyl Tap. Uh, I came up with that in the shower one day and had my equivalent of the, the bathtub eureka moment. Uh, but this is a series that we've been intending on doing for a long time, actually, as a an added feature, I guess, for you guys here who are giving a little bit more and supporting us, for which we are hugely grateful. Um, it's basically going to be a physical music and merch show. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you guys are nerds for records and for cool, just cool stuff um, in the same way that, that we are. And, uh, you know, I've got the shelf behind me over there somewhere um, that is nearly full and, and needs a friend, really. Um, but this is going to be the space, basically, where we are going to just nerd out over that stuff. Um, together, we'll be doing it as as regularly uh, regularly as we can, really, um, with whoever is available to hop on uh, and do so. Um, obviously, myself, Sam, and Alec are varied people, so what you will see in these videos will vary quite greatly depending on who is here to do them. Um, so that'll be cool to see. You know, I'm as excited to get a look into you know uh, my co-host's record collections as much as I am to just sit here and chat about doing mine. Um, but Vinyl, I think, is primarily uh, what we will have to highlight here. Um, but if there's any kind of particularly cool merch or, you know, just stuff to to show off um, as well, that can go in here, because why not? Uh, and we'll have a, just have a chat about it. So, um, you know, I used to... I used to watch a lot of stuff like this from uh, like black metal people on, on YouTube back in the day. And uh, it was an exposure point, I guess, for quite a lot of cool stuff that I may not have come across otherwise. So hopefully it could be a bit of a, a resource like that too. Um, I've got a pile of records I've selected here to uh, the right of me that I'm going to run through in two days episode. Um, mostly relatively new additions, but uh, I will gradually dip into the catalogue a bit as well. And uh, yeah, we'll see how this goes. So to start with, I've got Svalbard. Uh, What's the name of this record again? Shit, that's a good start. Uh, when I die, will I get better? Their titles are always very wordy in my defence. Um, but yes, Valbard, uh, one of the most popular records of last year, I think it's fair to say. Um, I, I believe that you guys voted it fairly highly into the uh, TNM Listener Top 20 of last year, which is cool to see. Um, yeah, great band, great record. Uh, this, this was certainly one of those ones that, you know, when it arrived, uh, was really well greeted in terms of like you know a band really stepping up to deliver something that a lot of people uh loved uh listening to and you know i can see where that that's coming from in terms of the you know that kind of mix of crust and black metal and post rock that svalbard have kind of always built their name on but um, maybe at times they've lent more on the kind of hardcore aspects of that or whatever um but this really felt like it upped a lot of the the melody and the uh, the prettiness and stuff like that and really building those big kind of post-rock crescendos and stuff like that so I can absolutely uh, you know see why more and more people were kind of turned on to Svalbard and really had their ear grabbed uh, by this particular record um, for me like you know it's a really really great record when uh, it came out and a lot of people were kind of talking about it kind of almost like this landmark record for Svalbard like you know them kind of really coming of age or whatever I think they've got a lot better in them still. Um, like, I, I, again, it, it's the elements of their upping that are really going to kind of appeal to a, a, a broader range of, of people. But um, I think they've got a lot better in them still. Like, th this is a, a great band who are not done giving just yet. Um, but again, really, really great to see kind of a step like this al along the way that uh, has really, really grabbed people. This is on a, a rather nice uh, kind of splatter there. Um, so this is where people will judge me for my record holding, whatever. I don't touch the grooves, obviously. I try and hold them like that. Um, but yeah, really, really nice looking record. Very, very nice sounding record. Um, I've not yet bought the Noctool album, which I should do because uh, that is also very, very good. But it was uh, wonderful having Serena on the show a couple of months ago to talk about her kind of black metal influences for uh, that particular project. Um, so yeah, go and check that out if you've not done so. It was a great time. Great record. Big up. Smell by uh, Next up is Electric Wizard with Time to Die. Uh, Electric Wizard are one of my favourite bands ever. Uh, they are one of those bands that I will just kind of collect everything from. Um, even though I only have their last couple of albums on this particular format, that's a bit of a mission for the, uh, for the future. Um, 
But yeah, Time to Die from 2014, this one came out. Uh, I've mentioned before, I think, on the show, in the kind of brief little moments we've spoken about Electric Wizard, um, how reception to latter-day Wizard albums can be a little bit weird in terms of uh, there's not really any kind of clear consensus on it. Like, the, the AFI of Doom Metal, if you will, in the sense that, you know, you can ask someone what their favourite and least favourite records are post the classic era and you'll get wildly differing answers so it means that there's it's hard to kind of uh it's hard to gauge really which are the kind of popular records i guess of their again post classic era but i i like this one a lot i mean i like pretty much all of them but uh this one is very very cool it's a uh i think the the, the record that most people who are kind of casually familiar with Electric Wizard will know will be Dope Throne. Um, that's a record that, again, I love very, very dearly. I had it in my top 20 albums of all time show. Uh, and this album, Time To Die, is almost a kind of a spiritual successor to that record. Um, it's got uh, Mark Greening back on drums who played on those classic Wizard records before being kicked out again post this for, I don't know, being high or too high, whatever. A bit of that Ozzy Osbourne situation. Um, but... Uh, yeah, the kind of the, the the sample that opens the first track on Dope Throne, and on the last track of this, as it closes out, it, it, they bring it back and it has kind of an extended couple of sentences at the re uh, the end of it. So it almost feels like it kind of come in full circle. But um, that really thick, kind of oppressive, heavy, nihilistic kind of atmosphere that you get out of like uh, doom metal on records like Dope Throne. Um, this is the record of the latter day wizard output that really does that um it's not as heavy as dope throne in kind of uh, a sense that obviously that record is spawned out of such vitriol and is just so unbelievably heavy that like a record made you know later on in life probably just isn't gonna handle that but um similar to what we were saying about i guess slipknot on the podcast recently about kind of like iowa versus later heavy slipknot things uh and you know you take those things because you know that they're not in the same place as they were earlier when they made iowa but uh they are like like there's a special kind of thing that comes from that. This album is like the the, the Solway Firth to uh, Dope Thrones People Equal Shit, if you know what I mean. Um, and in that sense, I'm cool with it. It's fucking great. Very huge, fat doom riffs, as you would expect from Electric Wizard, that are nasty, that are dripping in kind of just venomous intent. It's fucking great. Uh, I, I love the. Um, uh, there's a poster that this comes with where uh, Electric Wizard's like ascetic is just so one of my favourite ascetics, uh, just kind of you know cult, evil stuff, you know bloodthirsty, macabre, nocturnal. That's the vibe you're getting from a uh, Electric Wizard always. Um, was have to check for a second see if Nosferatu was in one of those crypts uh, like he is in, in SpongeBob episodes. Uh, but this is the um, Record Store Day 2021 uh, version of this. I did not go out on record store day to seek it out. I don't really do record store day very much. I don't kind of go and queue up outside shops or whatever, but uh, I did find myself in a record store about a week after the event and came across this and it would have been rude not to. It's on quite a nice dark green there. Uh, yeah, so uh, Electric Wizard, Time to Die. Recommend it if you like evil, fat, doom metal. And I hope that you do. All right, speaking of uh, occult evil and uh, bands that really get my aesthetics. I don't think there's any band in the world that does that quite as well as this one. Tribulation, uh, where the gloom becomes sound. Um, this is currently my album of the year. It has been since January when it came out. Um, even though I don't think it's Tribulation's best record. Um, it's just kind of, again, the, the nature of the year and the competition that's been around it. But uh, I absolutely love it. Like, I, I absolutely love it. Tribulation, and this record is another wonderful instalment into the the really, really kind of one of a kind trajectory that they have been putting out over the last uh, few records. Well, basically all their records, really, in terms of the trajectory of kind of like mad evolutions and stuff. But particularly like the last three records that have settled on kind of this Tribulation sound. Um, this follows on from the last two of those very, very nicely. This band are. Absolutely magic. I, I genuinely feel that uh, Tribulation are one of the leading metal bands in the world. They have developed a sound that is so theirs and is so unique. And uh, where the gloom becomes sound, the thing that I think particularly marks this record out uh, among the previous couple. That again, they've they've their first couple records jumped around in sound really fucking insanely, but they've kind of stuck to a sound and started developing that now. Uh, and the one that the the aspect that this 
really goes for is the tribulation sound, that kind of gothic metal that has its roots in death metal, but is pumped full of like 80s heavy metal, like kind of, you know, Merciful Fate, Dismember, and Sisters of Mercy all blended up into one one of a kind band. Uh, this one has the accessibility down of that. Like this one has, uh, you know, Johannes's um, growled vocals. They deliver really, really cool, like shout along uh, refrains and stuff like that, which sound amazing. Like his diction has gotten so good on it. Um, particularly like the first track in remembrance for that, like the chorus, like uh, it just gets stuck in my head a lot for what is a 100% uh, growled vocal chorus. I know that that's the sticking point with Tribulation and the reason they will never be as big as Ghost or someone like that is just that they have a growler and not a singer, but uh, they do have some really cool choruses on this record. And uh, similarly, like there's a sense of like huge arena metal to this record like while having all of the tribulation characteristics like it's got these really big muscular kind of pumping tempos that are awesome it's got really really uh like flamboyant flashy rock star guitar playing that is so amazing to hear uh, and at the same time it's got all of that same lovely evil occult tribulation atmosphere that i've come to expect from them um has really you know that, that kind of ritualistic feel to it uh i feel like tribulation are one of those bands that just really really get that sense of i know being truly, you know, kind of undead and mystical and, and, and magical in, in that way, while on this record, like I said, getting uh, kind of even more accessible in terms of um, just conveying that to people, which is always a good thing. Um, when I say about their aesthetics and stuff, like, this record is gorgeous. Like, I love the, uh, the like, the cover art, and kind of the whole record has this feel of, like, being hewn out of stone or something. There's a real kind of, like, classical art feel to it which again like there's a particular page where like yeah like look at this gorgeous absolutely gorgeous i like i would buy most tribulation items of merch uh if i had the money and the means and and, and to do so but uh yeah really really love uh the whole presentation of this band but the record as well in particular is um well i think it's the best record of 2021 thus far as we are sitting in august just over halfway through so yeah tribulation uh where the gloom becomes sound very, very good record. Please go and check it out. I think it's getting maybe a little bit lost because it came out in January. Um, it's, I've not seen as much talk about it as I think the album deserves, as, again, in terms of getting it across to lots and lots of people. Um, but yeah, next up is The Fly, uh, the score by Howard Shaw. Um, this is currently the newest addition to uh, the, the vinyl collection. As you can see, I've not yet removed the uh, shrink wrapping from it. Um, but... Uh, yeah, the, the the fly is this is a uh, a HMV hundredth anniversary uh, special edition. They put out a bunch of kind of different records and stuff, and I saw it kind of turn up in my email inbox and went, "Ooh, I should get the fly," uh, because uh, David Cronenberg, who directed the fly, is probably my favorite film director. Um, basically, until Robert Eggers makes enough films of kind of you know the witch, the lighthouse quality to. Uh, earn that title but in terms of like catalogue over you know decades uh Cronenberg would likely be my pick for the greatest of all time uh, and The Fly as his masterpiece I think um would be like top three movies of all time I absolutely adore The Fly with all of my heart um it's one of those movies like uh John Carpenter The Thing The Shining The Exorcist uh that has a real claim to just be like objectively the best horror movie ever made like it's in that top top category and part of that is it's got this kind of you know b-movie plot of like man becomes fused with fly in a like lab accident but it treats that instead of like you know schlock as basically like classical tragedy and howard shaw's score does a great deal of the kind of the heavy lifting when it comes to that like it's got such a level of of gravitas and circumstance to it like the huge operatic gothic kind of tragedy which really 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 works wonders for a film that is so so smart so scary so gross but at the same time it's really really heartfelt and really really has a kind of a deep humanity to it there's a there's jeff goldblum on the back and, uh, and gina, gina davis getting up to fly bits i suppose um but yeah like the, the music that plays during the the finale of, of the fly um that's on this like could make me cry it's so grand and moving and gives such incredible weight to 
what you're watching on screen, which in one way could be viewed as just like, you know, really fucking gross and really wacky and strange. Like, again, the, the effects and everything in the fly are just ridiculous, but like this uh, does so much to add into that tone of like sadness and again, like kind of Hollywood classical tragedy, which is just uh, such a beautiful mixture, I think. Um, Howard Shaw, a longtime collaborator of David Cronenberg um, scored most of his movies and uh, that was really fun for me to discover because like uh, a lot of people my age, I grew up watching the uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy, uh, just some of the best movies ever made, again kind of on a blockbuster level, but uh, Howard Shaw's scores for that, you know, the dun, 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 all of that is utterly incredible and kind of every bit as good to me as, you know, any... John Williams score for Star Wars or anything like that um, but you know growing up with that and then kind of getting older and finding out that the guy who did those also did all of this stuff with like you know the, the king of body horror was uh, super super cool and again like there's a lot of other Howard Shaw scores for uh, David Cronenberg films that are really really cool I love the one for Crash um, I love The Brood but uh, yeah The Fly one of the best movies ever Great score. Um, haven't had a chance to spin it yet, obviously, because it's in the wrap, but uh, I really look forward to doing so. Uh, next up, I've got something that is not new, but it's uh, something that we've spoken about recently in the uh, Top 20 Albums of All Time episode with Alec and Sam. It's Disfear with Live the Storm. Uh, I picked this up at the event that I frequently mentioned to basically wind up Alec uh, when I saw Disfear uh, in London in early 2020 at my last gig before lockdown i also bought um let me get it this uh really lovely print that i framed and, and keep uh by the side here super super cool um and i bought a really cool tote bag that i carry my records around in when i'm at events and such but uh, i picked up this record live the storm um if you've not heard us discussing that on on that podcast episode i will just say it again um cross punk super group uh features a bunch of Swedish musicians who, you know, some of them are entombed. Um, Thomas Lindbergh from At The Gates is the front person on this record. And the also, like, underrated Misanthropic Generation, which is one before this one. This kind of gets the most of the talk, but Misanthropic Generation is, like, nearly as good. Um, but at its core, this is one of the most alive-sounding punk rock records ever made. Like, it's so full-sounding, it's so energetic, it's so hard-hitting, and it's full of, like, proper songs as well. Like, if you are someone who has shied away from things like crust punk because it doesn't have you know songs but you like things like i don't know every time i die or the bronx or cancer bats or just any kind of raucous rock and roll influenced punk rock like that this would be the single record from the world of crust that i would throw at you because like the choruses on this the shout along gang hooks most of that podcast episode was just me and alec shouting them at each other because there's just so fucking many um they are immaculate and they just get in your head and they're so rousing and they're so fun again that show like just yelling those choruses one after another was just such a wonderful experience and at the same time the guitar leads on this and, and the solos are so good like Kurt Ballou produced rock and roll motorhead channeling Swedish DB basically and uh, if that doesn't sound like a good time to you then I'm sorry you're wrong um it's, it's this is fucking amazing like really is like I, I go on about it all the time, seemingly, but uh, without a doubt would be in my top five hardcore records ever. Um, it, it's just such a joy. It's so fun. I can't like not be just pumped up and and, and full of life when I hear this record. So uh, if you need some of that, Live the Storm by Disfear. Very much recommend it. Next up, uh, I've got Death Tomes with Adrenaline. Um, this was a Christmas present. This Christmas, just gone. Um, this was the first Deftones record that I really got into. Uh, you know, hearing like Engine Number 9 and Root and stuff like that and just being like, fuck yeah, riffs. Uh, over the years, it's kind of slipped down to mid-table Deftones because, you know, there's a, the realisation of like, oh, isn't White Pony good? You know what I mean? Um, Self-titled record, like unsung classic. But uh, I will always have a soft spot for Adrenaline for its really, really unique kind of tone in terms of it has the thing of uh Slipknot's debut record in terms of it's the only one of their discography that you could really call a new metal like the record like this is a new metal record it's got those kind of riffs it's got you know rapping on it all that kind of thing and it's not yet got the really like you know artsy stuff that kind of Deftones grow into but at the same time amid like the new metal movement it's got such its own 
energy and uh, like Deftones were on adrenaline. If this came out today, especially considering the amount of like new metal revival stuff there is, but like even without that, if this came out today, divorced from any kind of movement or anything like that, they'd still be like the hottest thing in the world. Like imagine if Loathe turned up with a riff like like Seven Words or, or like, you know, Nosebleed or anything like that. Like proper fucking stuff like not just a kind of underdeveloped debut record or however you might want to view it kind of post i don't know white pony um it's a really cool record as well like again it's just that kind of that that streetwise kind of thing of like you know really cool guitar riffs and tone uh you know the beats on it are cool chino's really cool on it obviously uh yeah really really cool debut record um had this on the other week while doing the cleaning and it powered me along very, very nicely. Uh, I think it's the only Deftones record that I have on vinyl because um, I've not really sought them out But uh, and as I said, this was bought for me but it's a, a very, very nice addition to the collection I should buy others because, you know, I'm not sure if you're aware, Deftones quite good. Uh, also, quite good, is Employed to Serve, Eternal Forward Motion. Uh, this was also bought for me at that same Christmas, um, hence why they are paired together. But uh, obviously, this is the latest Employed to Serve record. Uh, it's just fucking stink riff central, isn't it? Like, this is them going full, uh, you know, 4-4. Four, four. Well, there probably are weird time signatures on it as well, but it just feels just like instantaneous, like bam, bam, bam. You have bangers. And if you are looking for modern metal club bangers, no one's writing them now like Employed to Serve, which is mental considering where they started off and kind of, you know, the things they went through in order to arrive in this particular form uh you know even if you prefer those things like warmth nine sun would be their best record still for me but uh this is it's just how could you not be moved by it if you like just you know crunchy metal you know what i mean like if you like lamb of god or anything like that it's fucking mega like real choruses on it again like you know when force fed turned up it was like oh my god like that is the fucking thing that new single they put out this week um Mark of the Grave, I think it's called. Uh, it's a fucking piss take when it comes to just like showing up other metal bands who are supposed to be writing, you know, big songs. Bands who have fucking, you know, millions more fucking listeners and all that shit, like, because it's not shiny or whatever. But just in terms of big metal, crunchy, you know, obviously hardcore influenced songs, Employed Server fucking killing it. And um, here, the, this record, you know, I'm looking forward to the new record, especially now that that second single has dropped um that's very very kind of wet in my taste buds but uh this record setting on that style um they're just they're extremely good at it you know ode zero i think is my favorite track on this because again kind of got some of those like really mad employed to serve mathy guitars and stuff like that but in the context of just like oh my god like this riff just makes you want to bang your head uh yeah the cycle for this record seemed to go a little bit too quick for me in terms of uh obviously with lockdown and everything like that i only got the chance to see them once on it compared to the previous two when I saw them all the time. Um, so I would like the opportunity to see more of these songs live. Uh, but obviously with the, the new record coming out soon, I imagine there'll be plenty of them still in the set list. Uh, yeah, employed to serve, eternal forward motion. Uh, next few records are somewhat linked, so I'll go through them in the sequence that uh, makes sense. Um, the Oath, with their self-titled uh, debut record and only record, uh, Rise Above Records, had these back in stock. Uh, I'm not sure if they'd repressed them or something, but they had them back. So I grabbed one because it's a really cool record. Uh, and this is a band that if you're not aware of, uh, this record came out in 2014 and it had quite a bit of hype around it at the time, like really quite a, quite a buzzy thing, uh, but that it never really kind of went anywhere because they immediately broke up after like literally like weeks after releasing this record. I was like, right, the record's out. So yeah, uh, people were just like, what the fuck? But um, yeah, basically it's really cool, trad, 80s kind of style, heavy metal with this occult, you know, uh, kind of satanic, dark energy to it, which just elevates anything, doesn't it? That's how you make music better. You make it more evil. Uh, it's these two women who are on the front cover, uh, Linnea Olsen and Johanna Sadonis. Um, both of whom have gone on to be in other bands since this, which is what are the, the linked records I referred to. Uh, but this at the kind of seed point, it's a fucking great record for, again, that kind of trad heavy metal. Like when it came out, like uh, it had a really distinct sound to it. I think part of that is Linnea Olsen's guitar playing, which you can still hear now in her, her current bands. But um, like, you know, there's the first track on it, All Must Die amazing riff like when you press play on it that's how you announce your fucking heavy metal record it's got really rattly powerful raw energy to it that kind of in the room sense of being with a band and uh it's that with uh this you know really distinctive 
kind of timeless, entrancing singer, uh, this vocal presence in, in Johanna, which gives it this more kind of like occult, witch-like, you know, uh, Jinx Dawson from Coven kind of vibe that is, uh, you know, those two things together is amazing. Um, I love their, their logo. It's not on the front cover, but it's in here. Uh, designed by Eric Danielson from Watane, who does a lot of design work for bands and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, um, I, w I do wonder if it would kind of be a bit bigger now if it came out than 2014. Because like I said, they had that kind of buzz around it. Uh, and it, again, dissipated when they immediately broke up after putting the fucking record out. Uh, but, you know, two cool as fuck women playing evil-leaning trad heavy metal i think that's that style is a little bit trendier now than it was then in 2014 when like you know i'm not sure exactly what kind of was in the metal zeitgeist at that point in time um that it you know, wouldn't have sounded like this anyway uh but again if that came out now i don't know whether they would kind of be more popular or what but um it's it's a really really great record and there is a kind of magic around it i guess perhaps coming from you know they only did this one amazing record and then split but uh, if you like again kind of trad metal that sounds modern as well like it doesn't like the, the guitar tone and everything like it's got a kind of contemporaneous to it it's just playing you know old school heavy metal with a uh, a very kind of again um evil occultish kind of atmosphere uh definitely definitely recommend the oath and i absolutely recommend the other bands to have come out of the oath as well uh first up of those was lucifer uh this is um, Lucifer 1, their debut record, all of their albums are Lucifer number. Um, this was purchased when it was their newest record and they've just announced Lucifer 4, I think, that's coming out at the end of this year at some point. I look forward to that. Uh, this is the singer, Johanna, from The Oath, who went and formed this band post The Oath breaking up. Um, she was much quicker to the punch, I think, in terms of getting another project out, uh, which kind of helps the buzz around Lucifer, I guess. Um, Lucifer, they've got a lot more of a... Again, if the Oath was that kind of 80s trad metal thing, Lucifer went back on the timeline in terms of... Uh, nowadays, the records after this one, they've got a lot more like 60s and 70s kind of, you know, rock, classic rock kind of energy, which is really, really cool. Um, but this one is a lot more like classic doom. Like there's so much Sabbath on this. I think there's, there's, yeah, there's a song called Sabbath. <laughs> Don't know much more how uh, on the nose you want to get. But um, that, I think that obviously comes from the fact that uh, Lucifer 2 onwards... Um, the person who has joined Johanna in the band writing all the songs and everything is Nick Anderson um, who obviously was, was entombed but has also done stuff like the helicopters and stuff like that which kind of has that again uh, really old school kind of blues rock feel to it this record uh, the riff writer on it is Gaz Jennings who is the guitarist in Cathedral so it makes sense that there's much more of that uh, 70s uh, and 80s kind of style doom to it um, here though Johanna uh, really comes into her own as kind of like that, get that leader of the sermon type thing. That real, again, that kind of mystical uh, atmosphere and kind of delivery that re it, it stands out by kind of way of contrast and how kind of cool a voice that is uh, for that kind of music on the oath. This is like where that's naturally just meant to live, isn't it? It's just big, uh, you know, retro, I guess, to a degree, but uh, really, really just like kind of timeless sounding again, um, classic kind of doom on this record. Uh, she suits that like old school evil thing so so well and the hooks on this are super sharp as well while not losing that kind of um a atmosphere to them um they've never got quite big quite as big lucifer as i think they should have uh you know when they came out with this um obviously she came out of the oath and i remember seeing that there was a decibel cover on this where she looked amazing and she's like so obviously such a star when you listen to them um and kind of it felt like at that point in time there was quite a lot of buzz around this again but uh, they've never quite it, it, on, on an international level it hasn't quite happened for them in, in the way that I think the songs deserved but uh, yeah this is still a very good record and I do love everything they've done since as well it's on a rather nice kind of translucent-ish uh, bluey green which obviously matches the, the album cover uh, yeah Lucifer Linnea Olsen from uh, The Oath Me Marsh she went and formed Maggot Heart after being in Great Pleasures for a, a, a record but uh, this is Mercy Machine this was in my top 20 albums of last year, so hopefully some of you check this out if you've been listening to the podcast back then. Um, this band is so my idea of what cool is. Like, you know, for some people that might be, I don't know, Turnstile or something, which is very cool and fair, but like when I think of cool, I think of shit like this. It, it's really, uh, like musically, it's really abrasive post-punk. 
that it kind of has this heavy metal energy to the guitar playing as well. There's all sorts of like, you know, weird chords and um, kind of really like, again, abrasive uh, like licks and stuff like that. But the riffs are so catchy. Um, they have this really like simple and repetitive feel to it and they get ingrained in your head. I remember Bees uh, compared them to like helmet riffs in terms of just being like a handful of notes that just kind of repeat and they get in your head. But this has like much more, it's like helmet riffs with like Voivod chords or something. It's really fucking cool with that like post-punk kind of beat and energy underneath it. Uh, it's got this really great kind of deteriorating urban kind of angle to its atmosphere and stuff like that. And, and uh, Linnea, who, who sings on this, uh, she has this really cool sneery punk kind of societal reject kind of feel to it. Like There's a song called Gutter Feeling. Uh, and when she sings, um, I might be a rat, but I live as I please. I've been tripping on that gutter feeling. It's just such a fucking like scummy little anthem. It's got this really great feel of like, you know, uh, like a gang all in like black leather jackets skulking around the kind of disused shadowy areas of some cold European city or something like that. Um, which again, you've got the, the album artwork, which I absolutely love. Um, which, again, that kind of horrible, scummy, vomitous, you know, urban decay feel to it with this kind of surreal edge as well um yeah fucking awesome awesome band at the moment one of my kind of my favorites uh it's on a very nice red this record um they i think they're one of the best kind of cult bands on the planet i guess like not a very very big band i don't think this band while again they should be bigger than they are as is true of most bands that we fucking talk about on this podcast just because of how the world of music has worked for rock music and heavy underground bands for the past um, I don't know, 10 years. Uh, there's not quite the same, I don't know, crossover appeal as like Lucifer, for example, uh, just because it's so kind of abrasive, but the songs are really fucking great on it as well. Uh, so yeah, Mercy Machine by Maggot Heart. Definitely recommend checking that one out if you've not heard them so far. And the last couple that I've got next to me to, uh, to showcase here are not records that are brand new. They're records that have been on the shelf for a quite a number of years. Um, but it feels right to whip them out in this video, given some of the events of last week. Um, not Slipknot, sadly. I don't have any Slipknot records. I should really fucking buy some Slipknot albums on, on vinyl. But uh, Black Peaks is what I've got here. Statues. Uh, I got into this band when they were spoken about on TNM originally, like back in the day when this came out. And I'm sure that that will be the same for a lot of you here. Uh, and, and when I heard it, it was such a, a, a revelation. You know what I mean? Like the guitar playing was so sophisticated and progressive but they attacked it with this like hardcore bite uh, and when the singer you know hit those high shrieks he reminded me of how i used to feel about like matt, matt bellamy from muse like back in the day um, like my favorite song on this and my favorite black peak song ever has always been set in stone and that kind of just like fucking hitting that point is precisely why like my favorite record on the uh, song on the sucker record is home which again has that same when it goes in the chorus and he's like fucking on it like jesus christ when will lets the beast loose he is unbelievable uh this record was purchased at a co-headline show with heck um on the tour for this album and, and hex album um and they all signed it as you can see they did uh spell my name wrong uh, as as perrin with an i uh where am i pointing to there perrin with an i which is not me but uh in fairness it's a weird name um i didn't ask them to sign it but they just offered to do it because they're nice uh and yeah, I do not have all that divides on, on vinyl, which should be something I should remedy, seeing as um, these are now the only two albums that they're going to end up having now, which is a shitter. Uh, but what an amazing daily record. Like, so eclectic and so assured of itself and so anthemic at the same time and exciting. Uh, yeah, I really, really fucking wish that there would be more Black Peaks records and we get a lot more um, of kind of the, the vision that this was kind of channeling and coming from. But um, this definitely stands up as one of the best daily records of the last 10 years from one of the best UK bands of the last 10 years. So uh, yeah, cheers, Black Peaks, for being fucking great while you're around. And, and the last record that I've got, um, just because it was bought at the same show, is Heck with Instructions. Um, this record came out as I was getting into more kind of mathy stuff, like uh, mathcore was a kind of a genre that evaded my understanding for like the first few years of me being into heavier music i was much more into you know extreme black metal and grindcore and stuff like that and didn't quite get the the mathiness of this but um at you know around the time this came out like employed to serve had come out and that really helped and i was really beginning to like properly fall in love with, with, with dillinger and this coming along at that time was just right when you got riffs like good as dead 
like such an amazing music video as well. Do you remember that Good or Dead music video that everyone was talking about five years ago? Still fucking cool. And, uh, you know, chorus it is like um, the great hardcore swindle, really fucking hooky. Uh, and, and again, compared to um, the Black Peaks debut, this was a band that we've been aware of for quite a few years due to their, their years operating under the name Baby Godzilla um, before they got sued by Toho, funnily enough. But uh, to get that kind of full length statement from that band that had kind of so much talk around them for a couple of years prior, uh, one of those scenarios and it was such a step up and, and it was so killer, it was really, really fulfilling. Um, I remember that show with Black Peaks where both of these albums were, were purchased uh, during the end of See the Old Lady, which anyone will tell you is, is the highlight track of this LP and then of Heck's career really. Uh, and it was their set closer because why wouldn't it be? Matt's on the bar somewhere like having almost like a breakdown with that like, this is a Nova, this will never be over, that whole part. Uh, and uh, the other members of Heck were all in the crowd, like running around, like in the circle pit, stirring it up. And that included the drummer from Heck. And I remember spotting him, being like, hey, what the fuck? Like, how, how are you here? And then looking back up to the stage, and the, the drummer from Black Peaks had, like, at some point, seamlessly uh, jumped on the fucking drum stool and kept the beat running while Heck's drummer got in the crowd. And it was just such a, again, a hilarious moment of both the ridiculousness of Heck to be doing that and the guy gets the kind of camaraderie between the, the two bands for, you know, obviously Black Peaks drummer to kind of jump in at that point, um, which is, I don't know, just a nice little memory of both bands in terms of, obviously both bands are, are not here anymore and that is upsetting when both of them felt like they had a lot more to give. But both of these records to me now feel like uh, a cool little snapshot of an awesome time in the UK music scene. So yeah, heck, instructions. And that is what I had next to me for this particular episode. Um, I don't, I didn't know how long that was going to run. I'm not sure how long I'll edit this down to either. I've got about nearly 40 minutes on the clock right now. Um, I wasn't intending to be that long, but I suppose that's the kind of motto for our podcast so far um, in this particular incarnation. But uh, yeah, that's that's what I had next to me. I hope that you enjoyed that. Um, do give me a bit of feedback if you if you enjoyed it, because um, you know we'll we'll do more of these if you did enjoy it. I, I quite enjoyed doing that. Um, I'll be back at some point for more of all this. Um, we'll get the others as well to kind of have a crack at it too whenever they are able to do so and show off some stuff that'll be totally different to all that, which is nice variety. Um, I like talking about records and the stories that kind of come with them because, you know, where they came from, where they were picked up, all that stuff, because uh, it's just a nice way of engaging with the history of the music and the history of us as music fans. Uh, but yeah, cheers for, for watching and for supporting as always, and I'll see you next time.